Have you ever heard the phrase, dress around the gun? I'm sure you have. Anybody who's ever been around concealed carry or even tactical lifestyle has heard that phrase. And it's something that today we are going to tackle. I have a guest today. This is an interview with Alex Sansone, otherwise known as the Suited Shootist. And we are going to talk about why it matters for you to dress and look well, especially as someone who is a gun carrier. So I want to say welcome to episode number 48 of the Everyday Marksman. I am your host, Matt Robertson, and this is the podcast where we talk about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. Our website is everydaymarksman.co, and there you're going to find today's show notes, our social media links, all of our articles, other podcast episodes, and our awesome community of marksmen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am happy to have you here. Now, back on for the interview of the day with Alex. Uh, before we get into this, Alex lived up to <laughs> the, the image you have in your mind. Not that he was wearing a suit when I interviewed him, but he just was was dressed all cool with like a really nice flight jacket and he was smoking a cigar and drinking a whiskey, rocking a really nice watch out in his back patio in Texas as we were doing this interview. So with that, yes, there's some background noise. I did the best I could with cutting that out, editing it where I could, but don't, you know, if you hear it, that's what happened. He was outside and enjoying the nice evening weather. Um, All right. Now with that, let's actually just get right to it. Let's bring on Alex. Alex, welcome to the Everyday Marksman. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate you having me on. For my audience who doesn't really know who you are, take me back to the beginning and how you got into shooting at all. Um, I and it, it's it's hard for me to put a finger on the exact moment, but as far back as I can remember, I have always had this kind of internal locus of control when it comes to my personal safety. Um, I've, I've never felt that it was anybody's responsibility, but mine. Um, and you know, it's not like I grew up in a high crime area. I, I grew up on the East coast and the, the school that I went to was full of very influential, you know, kind of juiced in people. I was the kind of the black sheep of the, of the school where, you know, uh, nobody in my family was a, was a politician or a lawyer or a lobbyist. As a kid, I was, you know, one of those people pleasers. I wanted everybody to like me and, and all that. And I have recollections of those desires being taken advantage of for sheer entertainment value. That was kind of my first peek into just the fact that not everybody out there is necessarily a going to be honest and forthright with you about their intentions and B the fact that there are people out there that will use and manipulate others as it serves them. Uh, when I was in college in New Orleans, there the, the campus actually held kind of town hall where they wanted to address the, uh, the, the quote unquote rash of crime that was going on. And I was one of a small handful of students that actually showed up. Everybody else there was either faculty or administration, uh, along with campus police and, and all that. And they were talking about different ways that they could combat the at least perceived prevalence of this criminal activity around campus. And they were brainstorming all these ideas. I put my hand up. I was like, yeah, how about you stop telling people that they're safe? Like maybe kind of create an environment where they need to pay attention instead of just this bubble of, oh, don't worry about it. We got you maybe that added awareness might help. Um, and it was not well received as you would imagine. <laughs> so, um, another part of your story here was you said you worked at a gun shop. I feel like I've, everybody's read stories on the internet of like tales of the gun counter where you interact with a lot of people. So I'm curious, like what did you do and kind of what were some of the lessons you learned out of that? So, um, that was my first, first job out of college. It was almost a tourist attraction we had a, a very wide cross section of experience levels, interest levels and all that. Most of the folks that I was dealing with were more 
of the gun culture 2.0 to kind of take a steal, steal a phrase from from Professor Yamane, where they were the defensively oriented gun owners and gun buyers, um, because that was my area of interest as well. So how did that affect like where you started going with things? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I was insufferable. Like I today, I would not put up with gun counter me. I was that quintessential geardo where I was carrying two guns, a spare mag, a knife, and I lived in nothing but 5'11 cargo pants and, uh, you know, just the, the, the caricature of the two is one, one is none kind of uh, attitude. So it's funny because like, that's not the first time that's not the first time that concept has come up. Like I had an interview with mm -hmm. Justin, um, the revolver guy at one point, and mm -hmm. again, I said something similar where it was like, it seems like we live in a culture that says if you're not the guy carrying two guns and, and I think he said a clinch pick and an IFAC on your ankle and carrying around an extra tourniquet, like on, like in your pockets, like then you're going to get, you're going to die in the streets. And it's yep. like, does any, like in the real world, like if this is not your job, is anybody really doing that? Well, and that was it is, is that my life revolved around firearms at that point because it was my profession as well as my hobby, as well as my social circle, because a majority of the friends that I had at that point were either fellow employees or customers that I'd struck up relationships with. And that was kind of the, the central element to everything. But it was an eleven dollar an hour retail sales job, and so I, you know, when I was looking to develop a career as opposed to just a job, I had to branch out and start dealing with, uh, you know, other facets of society, and even here in Texas, which is stereotypically a very two A friendly kind of space, the people that I was dealing with in the business world, while certainly not opposed to the idea of uh, firearms ownership and many of whom even had their carry licenses, uh, the idea of actually carrying a firearm on a regular basis was unusual to them. It was the, if they thought they were going into a bad part of town or, or something like that, then they would take it, but it was not part of their day-to-day -day routine. And not because of any kind of limitation. It was just because they felt that it was unnecessary. Um, you mentioned in that, and uh, you, you are not, you like, historically, you are not a professional gun carrier. Like, a lot of people in gun culture would be like, oh, yeah, I was like, everybody is special forces or everybody was Navy SEAL. <laughs> and that's right. not your background. So I want to know how did you introduce to formal training? Um, aside from the state required uh, permit, you know, permit requirements, which I do not consider training. Um, the, the first class that I took, the first kind of, you know, two day open enrollment gun class was back in 2009. And one of my coworkers at the gun shop was an alumni of this, you know, of the school. He said, Hey, you know, dude's coming in. Uh, there's, there's a guy a couple hours North that has a farm that hosts him a couple times a year, come check it out. And so, um, that was kind of the, the, the first exposure to, I guess what's possible or what's available. Um, and then we just kind of tooled around a little bit. There was quite a few years of just kind of building up bad habits more than anything else. I think the first time I actually saw a shot timer was six years later when I took uh, the, the shooting portion of mag 40. So um, now I know you've gone on to do a bunch of training since then. We don't need to, to go into that because I want to get to this pivot point from sure. what you, you did yourself described wearing five eleven cargo pants, you know, the, the two guns on you all the time. And, and now you've gotten mm -hmm. to this position where you're a lot more focused on being like a regular life. And I think I remember one of the earliest articles I read of yours or, or was a or post on Instagram, but you had talked about something that spoke to me and this is about being like a member of society in like a balanced way. Yeah. And that, and like there's a stereotypical gun guy look that we all know that mm -hmm. doesn't fit in with that. So I want to talk about how you started, like how you made this pivot, like what caused that? 
Sure. So I was I was the gun guy first, and then once I got into the the business world, and uh, it, the, there was actually a requirement that we all be in a suit and tie every day, and you walk into the office, and it was abundantly clear there were people that looked like they belonged, and there were people that very decidedly looked out of place. That image is critical to communicating a certain degree of credibility. Mm-hmm. And so that was that was my first insight into, I guess, the, the necessity to control image through wardrobe. Once I got introduced to my wife, um, one of my first thoughts was, wow, she is like way out of your league. So you need to step your game up before she realizes that she's too good for you. Uh, and so that is when I really kind of started to dive down the rabbit hole of men's style. And like every good millennial, I turned to YouTube. There was one fellow I came across, a gentleman's name is Tanner Guzzi, and he broke it down into uh, these, these three archetypes of style, uh, which are your rugged, your rakish, and your refined very high level to kind of give you uh, templates of that, that the audience can visualize refined as James Bond, rugged as Indiana Jones and rakish is Jack Sparrow. And typically any, everybody is some combination of those three. That's really one of the focal points that I've been trying to drive home is, I mean, admittedly the name of the blog and the channel is the suited shootist. So that paints a certain image but really what I'm what I tried to do with that is simply kind of create that that dissonance because those two things don't naturally make sense together in the day to day world. But people don't draw a delineation between dressing well and dressing up. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's an important distinction is that mm-hmm. that a lot of people fall into a trap dressing around the gun. And for so many people, that means wear loose fitting clothing, wear something that's easy to pull out of the way so you can draw it, draw it quickly. But that does not going to work for everybody. If I could like Thanos snap something out of existence, it would be that phrase because you've got somebody who has lived bare minimum 20 something years of their life up to this point a certain way. And you're now telling them, if you want to take your personal protection seriously, you have to overhaul your entire lifestyle and now make this one thing the focal point. You see a large crop of gun owners who are gun owners, not gun carriers. They buy a gun, it languishes in a sock drawer, and basically they think, okay, cool, well, I've got the thing now, so therefore my problem is solved. And that's where their process stops. I, you know, as, as we're talking, I'm kind of thinking this idea of, you know, identifying in subcultures. And I think there's, there, we're talking about distinction between people who are really trying to show themselves as I identify as a gun guy, like you said before, the stereotypical gun guy versus somebody who is really trying to just fit into daily life and happens also have a gun. And I think most of us really would be better served by the latter. So don't build your life around the gun. It's build your life around being you and then include a gun in that. All right. So um, if I could, if I could wrap this down to then Alex, what would be, if you could give like two main pieces of advice to anybody listening to this, what would that be? Like two, three, whatever, but what's your top takeaways? So the first one would be how clothing fits matters, both in terms of how it fits on you in in regards to how that communicates a message out into the world. And once you have an understanding of the mechanics of that, it makes picking out gun carriers a lot easier. (laughs) So fit is a huge thing. Uh, The other one would be how we dress and how we wear that clothing is always communicating a message. The question is simply whether or not the wearer is in control of that message or not. At a fundamental level, anybody that is interested in 
kind of the defensive practices has an understanding that how you present yourself matters because everybody knows the tropes of, well, keep your head on a swivel, situational awareness, you know, walk, walk with a purpose and, and all of these other sound bites. Those are how you present yourself physically to the world. Well, how you dress is just a part of that equation. Um, one more question. And it's one that I asked to everybody. So Alex, and I have a sense of what you're already going to answer this one, but if there was Sure. One thing that you want people to stop doing right now, what would that be? Stop applying your perspective to everybody else. It's everybody's interpretation is the sum total of their experiences up to that point. And it, it applies to gear selection it applies to the tactical decision-making. It applies to just about every facet of this. What I choose to do and how I choose to do it is not necessarily the appropriate answers for anybody else. What matters is why I, I, I drew those conclusions and came to those decisions. If you are able to articulate the why to other people, number one, you've got a good foundation to stand on in terms of justifying your choices. Secondarily, you are then in a position to educate other people because if I can explain to somebody why I made the choices that I did, then that shows in the equation that they can then apply to their life so that that way, even if they don't get to the same what, it's educated and informed to the same degree. Good answer. All right, Alex, where can people find you if they want to get a hold of you after us to listen to this one? Sure. So um, probably the top three would be my YouTube channel and my Instagram page at well and Facebook at The Suited Shootist. Um, and then we also have a Facebook group called Bespoke Solutions, where it's a little bit more of kind of the in-depth conversations where we talk about some a little bit more problem solving a little more crowdsourcing will delve into some conversations of um you know like non-permissive environment kind of stuff creative solutions a little bit more of the of the mechanics of either living with the gun or alternative force options for those instances when the firearm might not be the most appropriate um and and just kind of kind of all of that um troubleshooting the integration of wardrobe and carry gear, all that kind of stuff. Great. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Hey, likewise. Um, you know, if I, if I ever get a podcast launched, I'd I'd love to have you on as well. I really appreciate you, uh, you taking time out today. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody in your audience that has any questions, I'm always more than happy to, uh, to make myself available and kind of, you know, help them out. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, Alex is really fun to hang out with for a while. There was a whole lot more we talked about. I didn't keep an in interview just so we could keep it a little bit more focused. Um, but really fun guy to talk to has done a ton of training with lots of great, great instructors out there. Uh, and it was just really good to talk. Now, the couple of things I took away from this one. Uh, number one was this idea of most people come to shooting well after they've developed some other lifestyle habits. And it's not fair for the people of the gun to tell them that, hey, you're not really going to be serious about shooting sports until you totally upend your adopted lifestyle and pick up a new lifestyle. In fact, that's probably going to push people away. So that's, that's number one takeaway for me is that be open to the fact that other people have different experiences than you. And the answer is not to tell them to totally change how they do their life. Now, with that, uh, this comes back to the opening statement, and that is dressing around the gun. Anybody who has trained in men's style or fashion in general is immediately going to spot why and how someone is dressed to support them carrying a gun, or they're going to look super sloppy. If you work in an office environment, professional environment, like a lawyer or politics or judge or anything like that, then it's expected 
to have a certain level of professionalism that carries credibility. And wearing an ill ill fitting suit or clothing in general is just not a good look. And that can limit your prospects for being taken seriously. And for most people, it's not worth it to do that just so they can carry their gun. So we have to learn how to do this well. And then thirdly, be mindful of what you're communicating to the world with how you dress. If you live in a place where it's perfectly fine to look like you stepped out of an outdoor shop all the time, then great. If you live in Northern Virginia, like I do and work around a lot of office buildings, you know, not COVID, we're all working from home anyway, then that's probably not true. And you should respect that. Uh, Be aware of what you look like, both physically and how you dress and what that is communicating to those around you. All right, that is it for me. Thank you for listening today. Have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next week. This is Matt signing out.